First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, it's usually a little warmer on the uh, 31st of July, a little warmer and drier, so uh, it's an interesting cycle of weather we're in. But uh, my name is Scott Keller. I'm the president of the Indian Hills Fire Protection Board. Uh, we felt it was important uh, that we do an information meeting uh, somewhere during the summertime period uh, to address uh, the risks that we face. And as we developed this, uh, and we, we basically settled on using wildland fire as kind of the, the active threat we want to talk our way through because it's likely the most dangerous and the most impactful to, to our community. So uh, I want to introduce the members of the fire department that are here, Chief Emery Carson, Assistant Chief Mark Rosenberg, EMS Captain Bob Fager, Wildland Fire, okay. Lieutenant Mike Fasula. Uh, and we have a member of the Jefferson County Office of Emergency Management, uh, Gray LeCert, uh, who's going to talk to you about how you get notified when bad things start happening, which we hope we never get notified about. Uh, we'll walk our way through uh, kind of just basic community preparedness, uh, what we want to try to address, uh, and then Gray will talk to us about the notification systems and what you might expect if an emergency were to occur. Uh, and then Mike's going to talk through how to get ready for that, and that includes not only basic preparation of your family, make a plan, things like that, but also um, fire mitigation around your homes to improve the fire department's odds of being able to save your save your property. Okay, uh, if you don't do that, it's very difficult for any fire department, let alone volunteer fire departments, to, uh, to preserve and save property. Sometimes, you know, even lives. And um, I don't know. Most of you have probably lived in Colorado for a while. You know, we have an experience, uh, you know, unfortunately, a very solid experience of wildlife fire across the state with some loss of life. So this is not, this is serious business, and that's why we felt it's important for us to walk our way through and talk about it. Uh, we also have a member of the uh, water district here, Operations Manager, Chris Waters, who wants to also address uh, as a governmental partner with us uh, here in the community, uh, the impacts you might see to the to the water district as well. Uh, and then the last piece we want to wrap up with is a discussion about really interesting things, fire codes and potential changes to those, just as an informational piece and kind of a discussion piece to get, uh, see what your thoughts are on, on those potential uh, modifications we might adopt as a board uh, to the International uh, Residential Code and Movie Code. So. Um, Obviously, if you've lived up here, you know we get snow emergencies, we lose power. Uh, those are typical kind of emergencies. They're a little bit easier to control. Eventually, the snow belts or gets cleared, we can get out. Uh, you've got to plan for that, though, if you haven't. Um, the loss of uh, power is, is significant sometimes because some of us, I'm on a well. So, uh, you know, I could shower, have water, uh, you know, unless I plan ahead for that. So those are the kind of things you need to walk your way and think, think through. Uh, the wildland fire risk, however, in my view, is, is uh, the most dangerous that we face, mostly because many of us spend our work day outside the community, uh, and if there's a significant wildland fire risk going on, uh, it's going to be very hard for us to get back in, if we can get back in. Uh, and then, of course, Gray will talk about how that notification system works and, and what we might need to be prepared ahead of time to deal with. Uh, lots of us have animals. Uh, you need to talk to your neighbors about that and make sure that if you have people that are in the community during the day, uh, let them know you've got animals and, and make, make a plan for those as well to get them out. Uh, because again, the likelihood you're going to get back up in here if there's a significant wildland fire going on is pretty low. Uh, and that's just a fact. I mean, and that's what we want to try, try to talk our way through today with, uh, with the plans and, and things like that. Um, I want to show you currently how the state assesses the WUI risk for our community. There's a lot of red. You want to talk about this at all? Or yeah. I mean, I'll orient everybody just so you know. This is our district here. The black, basically, rectangle outline. That's 470 and 285. 285 runs through. This is probably Gulf Road. So you can see. Uh, yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> The legend. Yeah, highest risk, high risk, and then the low risk are probably where none of us live. There's no roads there, of course. 
probably because it's open meadow land, things like that. So, uh, rock out croppings, yeah, yeah. And this, of course, the barren area, we know what that is. That's the place of pulling all the rocks out of. So, you know, the wildlife part's not going to work here. The point of this is not, you know, to say chicken low or, you know, look out, we live, I mean, we, we should know this. We live, we live in an area with tall timber. Uh, right now, it's all wet. Okay, it's again kind of an odd, odd season for the middle of summer, but I guarantee you before October it's all going to dry out and you basically have fuel ready to burn. Okay. But don't, uh, I mean, Evergreen had a small grass fire, 20 by 20 grass fire today, so everything looks nice and green, but down below it's pretty, it's getting starting to dry out out there. Now I know there's rain in the forecast, so just keep that in mind that it does happen still, even now we've had a wet year compared to last year. So. Yeah, at the state level, we used to talk about the wildland fire season. It was like, you know, the summer, uh, like maybe May or so to October. And there's fires all year long now. Boulder County burns up, it seems, about every two months or so. They've got something, some sort of fire going uh, up in that and the county area. So uh, the point to this is, is that we have to take this seriously in this community and understand that, uh, you know, there's some things we can do, some things that we're not going to control. Uh, but, but taking preparedness steps and understanding how the system is going to work when uh, an event occurs is, is critical uh, for, for us to protect our family, ourselves, our pets, animals, as well as our property. So, you want to add anything else? Yeah, and, and I bring up Scott's point there. People that have horses up here, there's a gentleman who has a great thing called the heat team. You know, to help you evacuate your horses over probably to the fairgrounds where they're going to go. Uh, the other thing is, once you evacuate out here, they're not letting you back in. So, you know, be prepared when you start getting that, that first level of calls. Great, we'll go through the levels on all that stuff, but be prepared. I mean, we're not going to let you back in once, you, once you're evacuated out of this. And we'll go through evacuation routes and all that other stuff. So, we do take it serious. We train very hard for this. We, we try to save things, but as you, many people have been in this community a long time. There's only one way in and one way out of a lot of these roads, and, and it's not very wide. So. I know when the wildfire breaks out, we're going in on skinny little roads with apparatus and everybody's trying to get out with their horse trailers or whatever the case may be. So keep that in mind when an evacuation got an evacuation does happen. Okay? Thank you. Okay, Gray, you're up. <clears throat> so then we have a bonus up front. Um, so the chief asked me to talk about Smart 911, which is not part of my presentation. Uh, it's not an emergency management uh, application, it's actually between you and dispatch. So Smart 911 is a system, it's a free system you can register with uh, and you associate it with your address and your phone numbers. And when you call 911, so that's the key, we can't search the database for information about you. You have to call 911 and then we see your profile. Uh, you create your profile and pretty much you can tell us whatever you would like to tell us. Um, so some of the things we'd like to know are do you have medical conditions so that if we get a 911 call and nobody's talking or unable to talk, we would know what we can tell the EMS providers responding, what your conditions are, what are your medications, what might be your gate code, what's the garage door opener code, Where's you, where do you have the key stored other than you know at the top of the door in that flower pot, uh, things like that. Some people like to attach pictures, they like to attach information about their pets, please rescue my 16 dogs and four cats, and 20 goldfish. You can put a lot of information in your profile. And again, it's not something that we, when we get bored, can just start searching uh, to find information about you. You have to call 911 and it pops up on their screen when you call 911, kind of filling in the blanks. And so, surprisingly we do, uh, so my background is 25 years in law enforcement, 20 years here with Jeffco, and we get a lot of 911 calls with nothing, and we have to go to all of those. And sometimes it's nothing. A lot of the times it's somebody who can't talk because they're choking, or they are on oxygen, there's other medical problems, and we have no idea what we're going to. It could be just somebody knocked the phone off. And, uh, remember the old cordless phones? Those had a propensity back in the day, most people don't have those, uh, that when the battery died, they would call 911. Went to hundreds of those. Phone lines, if you get water in them, like tonight, <laughs> like to call 911 because they short out, and 911 is where they go. Uh, so there's lots of reasons we could be called, but having that profile provides additional information. 
It also will link with your cell phone. So if you call 911 from your cell phone, it will give, hey, this is where I live, this is where I work, here's my medical issues, whatever, wherever you might be at. So there's these green cards back on the table. We used to have a nice three-fold brochure. Apparently, um, that's too much paper, so we do business cards now. So these are back on the table. Um, it's free. Just go to smart911.com, register, and that will be available if you call me. Okay, so that was the bonus. I would also like to say that I uh, keep my streak alive with the weather. You can thank me for tonight's weather. So every time I do this presentation, something's going on with the weather. Uh, and it's not like hot and dry, hey, that goes along with the fire theme. Um, we did it in Haiwan, and it was raining and so foggy, it looked like there was a wildfire outside. We did it on top of Conifer Mountain in June, and it was snowing. And tonight, it's raining down here. So I'm used to that um, anyway. So the reason why I was brought up to talk to you is um, I'm our expert on notifications and evacuations. Why am I the expert? Because I'm the one who wrote the county's plans. Um, so a lot of work goes into these plans. Um, our notifications uh, plan has actually been adopted by so many counties now I've lost track. Um, but virtually every county around us now uses the same notification plan that we do. Um, not that I'm bragging, but it just makes it easier for everybody that we're using the same message. So I happen to be the one who wrote this plan, and they were like, oh yeah, well, let's just use that. Um, so that's where I get the credit, is I did it first. So <laughs> here's a, a graphic for those of you who like really cool PowerPoint graphics. Uh, this is the one graphic that I self-generated. So this is just demonstrating we have a wide variety of tools. So most people think public notifications, oh, it's that reverse 911 thing, right? Well, reverse 911 is actually a trademark product name, so we don't call it that. Um, the product that we use to do that is Code Red, so most people have probably heard of Code Red. If you come from other counties, you might have heard of Everbridge or a variety of other ones. We use Code Red, and Code Red is right here. So we start at the bottom. What's at the bottom is what we use the most, most frequently, and what is our threat level. So we use social media about everything. Uh, and then we have a thing called Jeffco Alerts, so you can go to jeffco.us and you can sign up for the various types of alerts you'd like to receive from the county. Uh, it could be just road closures uh, when we do construction. Uh, the most frequent ones that I get are open space parks, so anytime they close a trail uh, or open a trail uh, because of mud or because of mating season or whatever, uh, you get those alerts. So that's just another option. We have variable message signs and boards, so the ones you see on 285 where they have on Wednesdays the cute message every Wednesday, right, of how many fatalities we've had in traffic. Um, when we have evacuations going on or an incident, we do post to those. Uh, we call it CDOT. Uh, most of the time, it's we know there's a fire and you don't have to call 911. Uh, but we do post on there evacuation information as well. We also have the mobile ones, which you probably see every now and then. Uh, we can deploy those as well. We use the media, people who want to use uh, radio or television. And then we get into the specialized stuff, and that's where we hit Code Red. And we use Code Red for both life safety stuff and other stuff. And I'll get into our messaging types later, but Code Red hits phones, uh, emails, text messages, and uh, TTY devices for the hearing impaired. And there's also an app, we'll talk about that as well. And then once we get into this circled area, these are only used for imminent threats or protective action, so that we, we are saving lives with using these. So we have the Health Alert Network, and that's uh, through public health, touches anybody licensed by public health, uh, and includes dialysis centers, doctor's offices, all sorts of people. And that's why we include that in there, because we can reach a varied audience with that. Uh, the one that I uh, dislike the most, because I've done this many times, from Little Fires to Hayman Fire, uh, the door-to-door -door notifications. So that is a commitment that the Sheriff's Office makes that no matter what all this other technology and other stuff is doing for us, we will always send deputies door to door. And we also recruit other people as well. So you might see an open space ranger, you might see Denver Mountain Parks rangers, you might see a state trooper, you might see Morrison PD. Uh, we will use all of those to help us with the door to door notifications. You notice I didn't mention one group that's in this room. So if the hazard is wildfire, we are not going to pull firefighters to go door to door because we want them fighting the fire. Now, if it's a flood or something else, we're more than happy if they're not doing rescues to pull them into that. But just be aware that since we're talking about wildfires, 
you're probably not going to see a firefighter unless he's doing something else going door to door to do those notifications. They mentioned our animal rescue, so it actually might be animal control or one of our JCART teams out there doing door to doors as well uh, because they're doing the animal rescues. Uh, that is probably one of my least favorite duties as a deputy um, is so traffic control because everybody's crazy and wants to kill you when I'm standing in traffic, right? So I hate that. And uh, doing traffic stops along the highway, same reason, and then dealing with evacuations in a wildfire because we're not really aware of what, and we're trying to get people out, and that's our mission. So they give us crap all the time about not leaving. We're like, well, we're out of here. You shouldn't be here. Well, the sheriff says we stay. So until the fire is right here, we are staying, and that is how we operate. Um, and we've come close to losing deputies, but that's, we would much rather risk losing a deputy to notify as many people as possible. So we use the door, old fashioned door to door notifications. Now we're not gonna be standing at your door for two minutes pounding on it. Uh, you're lucky if you're gonna get us for like 20 seconds. So we're probably gonna hit the doorbell a bunch of times, pound on the door, probably look through the window real quick, and then we're off to the next house. Uh, notifications take a really long time, a whole lot longer than you think. We did an exercise down in Ken Carroll um, in 2016, and we had 15 deputies and rangers going door to door in Ken Carroll, which is not spaced out like up here, right? So they're residential neighborhoods, uh, big houses, but they're not that far apart, right? Uh, they're right on top of each other. So in two hours, they were able to get 400 houses that are that close together with 15 deputies. So you can do the math there, roughly 150 per hour is what we're going to be at, and that's assuming we can muster 15 people to do notifications. So we have public address and outdoor warning sirens. So some venues have uh, PA systems. The town of Morrison, they can talk through their one uh, siren in town um, to tell people messages. And we move up into the newer technologies, the wireless emergency alerts. So if you get Amber alerts on your cell phones, it's the same technology. Uh, so I can hit that. Uh, we can target cell phones within a particular area with our message. I'll show you what that looks like. We have no weather radio. Does anybody have a scanner or a radio that has no weather radio for tornado warnings and things like that, other than the responders who should? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, our radios. <laughs> it's actually more popular in the flatlands in tornado territories because that's how they get the most accurate tornado. Uh, because that thing's quiet until that tornado warning goes off. So. Uh, we can send messages to that. And the final the tip there is the emergency alert system, the annoying tones you hear on your radio and your television. And the reason why that's at the top there is because when I launch that, I'm probably hitting two and a half to four million people, depending on the time of the day. Uh, because the way that works is it says any broadcaster that hits Jefferson County has to transmit that message, which is every Denver Metro television station. And they have a wide coverage, right? So you can get Channel 9, like out on the Western Slope, uh, you can get it out in Kansas, and then remember that anybody who's watching it on cable also is going to get that. Um, so we're not worried about that because, if, as my boss says, if I have to watch every tornado warning in Washington County all summer long, they're going to hear about my fire evacuations. Um, so that's why that's up at the top, uh, because that's a huge audience. So we have two types of messages, and this is part of that notification plan I told you that everybody's adopting because we all want to use the same terminology. Uh, so we have advisory messages, which provide you information, but don't actually require you to do anything. Most of our public notifications are actually advisory messages. And it's usually something to the effect of, there's law enforcement presence in your neighborhood, don't worry, please don't call 911. Uh, because people call 911 all the time to say, hey, there's a cop across the street, and um, what's up with that? <laughs> That's fine if it's one person, but then when it's 20 people, it gets a little crazy. So sometimes we will literally send a message and tell people, you're OK, don't call 911. The other messages we send out are instructions. And so we're going to give you information, and then we're going to require you to do something with that information. So we have three standard instructions, and they're all in plain English. First one is shelter in place. So that's the exact opposite of an evacuation. So shelter in place we use for tornadoes, for law enforcement events, hazardous materials events. We have used them in wildfires uh, because sometimes we can't get people out. And sometimes we can shelter people in place and protect you there rather than having you out running crazy all over creation where we don't know where you're at. Uh, so shelter in place says remain or go indoors. 
don't go outside, stay put, do not evacuate. Um, so for instance, if there's somebody running around with a gun, which is a very common shelter in place, um, we don't want to send you outside where the bullets are flying. We want you to be, and, and we actually tell you to go down to the basement, stay away from windows, things like that. So pre-evacuation um, is, we've changed the wording on this a little bit. This used to be kind of like, hey, stand by, you might have to evacuate. Well, people took that literally. It's like, well, all right, I'm standing by, which means I'm not doing anything. So what we want you to do is we're telling you, you might have to evacuate. Now is the time to do all the stuff he's going to tell you about on what am I taking with me. So we want you to actively prepare to leave. So when you see footage in wildfires and you see people loading up their cars with literally everything, um, you're doing that during a pre-evacuation. So my favorite story is a resident, when I was telling him to leave, was debating which living room lamp they wanted to fit in the car because both of them wouldn't fit. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure neither of them is going to help you in this situation. Uh, but they were so stressed out that that lamp, they had to figure out how to get it into their little hatchback. Uh, so hopefully you plan ahead. So I have two items that I'm going to take with me. One is my file server that has all my documentation, which is electronic. And then I have a small safe that has all my paper documentation. If everything else burns, I'm okay with that. I'll live with it. So know what you're going to take. This is the only time you're going to have to plan to take that. So we want you to actively prepare to leave. That means you're loading your car, you're assuming you're leaving, and then if you get a call that says leave, you're ready to go. I also compare this to when you're at the airport, right? There's like 16 levels now of people who get the board ahead of you, right? Depending on how much you pay how important you are. Uh, this is kind of your pre-boarding notice. So if you need extra time to get on the airplane, this is the luxury that pre back. So some people need more time. Maybe you are bedridden and you need your family needs more time to load you up. Maybe you don't have transportation. This is the time you're calling somebody to get you transportation. So that's what we mean by actively prepared. All those examples. And in fact, in our messaging, we list off some things you might be, want to be doing uh, just in case you don't know what to do. And then we always tell you, hey, if you feel like you need to leave, you don't have to wait for us to tell you to leave. So if you see and you're like, that's too close, I'm out of here, you're free to go. Finally, when we get to the evacuation, there is no actively preparing anymore. We have run out of time. So pre-evacuation, the way I teach it, because I teach both sides, right? I teach you guys what it's going to look like coming to you, and I teach them on how to do it. So what I teach the responders is, this is a luxury. This means you're on top of the game and you can predict where the hazard's going to be and how long it's going to take you to evacuate. And if you get a pre-evacuation, hopefully that means that they're on top of it. Because most of the time, we don't have this luxury. We go straight into an evacuation, which is, you don't have time to pack, you're leaving right now. And why do I say leave immediately? It's because we know the reality is, national studies have shown this, on average people take a minimum of 30 minutes to leave after we tell them to leave. So even if you left 30 minutes in, you still may not have time. So don't do your packing when you get that evac. Packing is done. You need to walk out immediately when you get that evacuation. So what does this messaging look like? We use standardized messaging, so it's always going to look very similar. And uh, a lot of work goes into these. A lot of people have their say in it. Uh, how we arrange our message is, first we identify ourselves, because I'll get into why we do that. Uh, and then the most important information comes in the first 10 seconds of that message. Because I know statistically after 15 seconds, my viewing audience, listening audience, drops off. And about the longest I can go is 45 seconds. And anything beyond 45 seconds, I'm not talking about. So, this is a voice message. So what you see in the white bold there, those are the template items that our dispatch center has to fill in. So the first responders out in the field will call up our dispatch center and say, hey, I need you to do an evacuation of this particular area. And then they give them the information that they fill into this message. So in this case, this is a pre-evacuation. And this is what would come out over your phone, the message that you would hear. It's going to be a robot voice 99% of the time. So the reason for that is because 
Uh, some agencies always insisted on reporting it because people listen to reported actual human voices more than robot voices. However, that takes like three, four, five more minutes to record. So my view is if people are going to die in the time that it takes for you to record that, I'd much rather a robot voice make a phone call. And then we can go back later and we can record it if we have to. So you're going to hear a robot voice. The reason we say date and time is because there's people who still have answering machines. They don't have timestamps. And they come back from vacation three weeks later and they hear that and they call 911 and say, what? What's going on? And they're like, yeah, that was a long time ago. Don't worry about it. So we actually include that in our message. It's the date and time. Jefferson County Sheriff's Office has issued a pre-evacuation order. And as you can see, we go through here. Same thing I just told you in a nutshell. Things you should be doing. You should arrange for transportation or other mo mobility assistance, relocate your livestock or large animals, pack essential personal belongings, medication, special dietary items, infant care items. These are all things people forget, by the way. And if you're unable to attain any of this, call us. So we're kind of giving you a hint of the things you should be doing while you have the time to do that. And we know the first call you're going to make is to your neighbor or to a family member to say, hey, I got this message. Do you believe it? So here's an email. Uh, example for an evacuation order. So one of the things we try to do is use whatever medium we're using to its full advantage. So in our email, we give you links. So this link here on animal evacuations actually takes you to a map that we've created that shows the traffic pattern, how to get to the fairgrounds and the uh, Foothills Animal Shelter, what the traffic pattern is, where to go, so that you have that before you get there. Um, we also link you to our Twitter accounts and to our website, which is where we post all the information where we're saying additional information is available. Um, and we give you addresses because if you're looking on the phone, you can actually click on that and it'll pull it up in your map for you as well. So as you'll notice, in the evac, we're shorter because we're not giving you time to pack your stuff. We're not telling you what you should be doing other than leaving. But we do try to give you the primary and secondary escape routes. Now, sometimes there's only going to be one route. Sometimes there might be three. Sometimes we may not know. Uh, and sometimes that might change from the time he asks for it to the time it actually gets to you. Now that route doesn't work anymore. Um, so you have to stay tuned for that additional information. This is what it looks like in text. We have to keep them very short in text message. So bullet statement is all I can get. Pre-evacuation for your area. Be ready to leave any time. And then we give you a link. So this is a short URL code that goes to our Twitter account. Because I assure you, we tweet prolifically, and that is the most up-to-date information you can get out of the sheriff's office or any response agency. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a fire, and I sent the helicopter out there for them, and our fire management officer called me and said, hey, they just made the first drop. And I said, I know. He's like, no, they're literally doing it right now. And I said, I know. I'm literally watching it on Twitter right now. Because uh, it was a live feed on Twitter of the helicopter making that drop. So that's why we link it to that. Again, I can't get a whole lot in that text message because of the, the character constraints, but I can link you over to Twitter where you can get additional information. So let's talk about how Code Red works. Um, it is uh, an opt-in system except for your landline. So CenturyLink or Comcast Voice over IP or AT&T, we have your phone numbers. If you have a cell phone or other Voice over IP service, that happens in every presentation I do as well, by the way. Sometimes I might set that up. I want to talk to you in private without all the firefighters. So uh, you have to opt in. So your cell phone is not going to be in there. If you have another voice over IP provider, they're not, they don't provide that information. So only AT&T and Comcast or Xfinity transmit their voice over IP phone info to our 911 database. So we send our 911 database into the system. So you have to opt in for everything else, email, cell phone, uh, so forth. So how does this work? So over on the right side of the screen here uh, is an actual map that I pulled out of code red. So this is what it looks like. So this is down uh, in Camp Carroll Ranch. And so this orange area is what I drew that I want to send my notification to. Uh, so I can be very precise when I draw those in there. Uh, we can zoom in further. We can literally go around single houses if we need to. Uh, this is the area that I drew. And then you'll see all these red dots which represent the addresses. And the way the system does that is any red dot that's in that shaded area gets the phone call. So that's how we draw. So 
We can be very precise or we can be very imprecise if we need to. Uh, how many people got uh, our code red test in December? Okay. Okay. You remember December? Other than the firefighters, I'm going to preface every question now. Now, how many people have code red signed up? Okay. So look forward to December that we will be calling you again. We do it every December. Uh, it's usually about the second week of December. Um, and in all honesty, we actually picked that because we need to get past election season because people don't answer automated phone calls during election season. <laughs> so we wait until December when your card is off because the election calls aren't coming anymore. So the other thing that I freely share because I don't think it's a bad thing is we actually only communicate with 30% of the people that we call. Now, Code Red and I disagree on how we do stats. So the way they consider a successful communication is if they get to leave a message or they talk to a person, that's a success. I have higher standards. So if I leave you a message, I don't know if you're just screening your phone calls and you call back and get that message 30 seconds later or if you don't get it for three weeks. I don't know. So I assume you didn't get it. So all of our planning revolves around 30%. We're very, very consistent on 30% actually answer that phone live. And people would say, well, that's a horrible system. Well, I just hit 30% of my target audience right there. So 70% to go. So I've knocked out 30%. Um, and that's just a fact. People screen their calls. They don't answer strange phone numbers calling them. People don't answer calls in general. I don't. Uh, so. That life connection rate does not bother me. It's just a fact of life. That's why we have all those other tools. So how do you register for Code Red? So you can't just register once with Code Red. It's very jurisdictional specific. So uh, you have to register with Jetco's system. So the link to do that is your911.net. And if you can't remember your911.net, then just Google Jeffco Code Red. And it'll be the first result there. Uh, so, anybody can register, you don't, we don't verify anything, uh, but you do have to actually affiliate with the Jefferson County address. The reason I say that is a lot of people might be taking care of somebody. Maybe you have an elderly family member who lives in Jeffco, but you live in Arapahoe. Obviously that's not the case because you all live here, right? Uh, but think Arapahoe, because Arapahoe uses code red. So maybe you have somebody in Arapahoe. You can register in Arapahoe system, connect yourself to that relative's address, and then if they get a notification, you're going to get that notification, and then you can react to that. So you can register multiple addresses. So for instance, I'm registered at my house and also at my office. Um, so you just have to have that. We had a, I did this presentation up in Cold Creek Canyon, which is a whole lot more geographically complicated because it's in three different can or counties, three different notification systems. So the question was, I didn't get a notification during the last fire, and of course the reason was because she was in one county where the fire was not, but she had horses not too far away in another county where the fire was impacted. So the solution to that was you need to register yourself with that county at your horse property so that when they do make that phone call, you get that at your house. So you just have to have a Jeffco address when you register. Uh, there's also a Code Red app for your phone, uh, which I actually prefer because that travels with you. So anywhere you travel that uses Code Red will actually uh, alert you based off of your proximity. Uh, and even if you're traveling within Jeffco, you might be away from your house, but you're down in Conifer and we put out a notification down there, you're going to get that because the app knows you're down in Conifer where that notification went. Uh, now, about the time that I said this in my last presentation in Conifer, Park County sent out a message, and my app went off, and I'm like, well, I did not plan that. Uh, but that's a free app um, for both Android and iOS. So I wanted to point this out to you, because this is a frequent question, is uh, what does it look like when you call? So the phone number that you're going to see is this 866-419-5000 number. It's always the same number. It doesn't matter which uh, jurisdiction calls you from code red. It's always the same phone number. Um, and then the caller ID is going to say emergency com. So what I recommend and what I've done is, because that's confusing, 
is I've added that in my phone. Yeah. And I say code red. So when it pops up, I know, oh, that's code red calling me. Uh, instead of 866-419-5000, which means absolutely nothing. If you get a text message in code red, it's going to come from this number, 76993. Same thing, add that in your cell phone as a uh, phone number. And again, this is on the Jeffco site if you aren't taking pictures. I'm taking pictures. <laughs> Somebody always plans ahead. You go to a lot of presentations, don't you? That's actually far more common than writing notes these days. I, I, I'm used to people, oh, hold on, I need to take a picture. I do that too. So <laughs> add that to your cell phone as well so you know who's texting you. So let's talk a little bit about evacuations uh, and why people don't leave. So this is kind of important to me because I need people to leave, so I need to know why they don't leave. So anybody know what's our top reason why people don't leave? Animals. What's that? Animals. Number two, close. Any other wild guesses? Come on, it's you don't believe the government. <laughs> so you get a message and you're like, well, I need to verify first. So you call your neighbor. Everybody's got that neighbor on their block or in their neighborhood that knows everything, right? And you always call them. It's like, all right, all right do you see this fire? Is this legit? Because I'm not sure Jeff knows what they're talking about. So the first reason is actually you need to verify and validate. You're not sure that that's legit. You need to turn on the news. You need to look out the window, call your neighbor, call your brother, whatever it is. So that's the number one reason. She revealed reason number two, which is you're afraid we're not going to take care of your pets and livestock. So in Jeffco, we are absolutely obsessed with the animals. Um, so we had one of the first uh, county level animal rescue teams in the country. Um, and it goes back to High Meadow and before that, I mean, way back. Uh, so we have teams that that is all they're doing. So while deputies are going door to door telling the humans to get out, we have rescue teams loading up horses and llamas and emus and fish and lizards and everything else. And if you need an animal rescue, Dispatch hates this, but it is true. We tell you, call 911, and we will send somebody out there to get it. So Scott was telling you, you're not going to get back in, you're not going to get back in, you're not going to get back in. That's probably true, but you can still call us, and we will go get your animals. Uh, now, a better try, solution. Try, try to go get them. Right. Uh, again, they, the people on these teams are going to do their best under any circumstances to do everything they can until the very last second. Um, so what would be a better solution is coordinating that ahead of time with your neighbors, right? So, hey, when I'm at work, if something happens, can you grab my cat and the dog and here's where I keep the crates and, and all that? Uh, because that's a whole lot easier if you work that out amongst yourselves than us sending in people and they are not familiar with your animals or where you kept everything and trying to communicate all that in an emergency. But whether it's uh, your goldfish or you have a bowl, uh, we'll take any of those. And so also the next question is, well, what's the charge on that? There are no charges for the rescue. There's no charge for keeping the care of the animals. So as long as we, you are under an evacuation order, there are no fees for uh, Foothills Animal Shelter or the fairgrounds for any of that. So our third reason is related to your property. You're not going to take care of that stuff. So one of the things that we do to counter that is we maintain deputies in that evacuation area to prevent people from uh, committing crimes within there. And it's actually exceedingly rare. I'm only aware of like two incidents in my 20 years in Jeffco that have occurred actually in Jeffco. Uh, there's rumors about it all the time, but I can tell you the reality is there's only two that I know of, and one of them was a guy impersonating a firefighter. And um, so, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about evacuation planning because I want you to see things from our site. So evacuation planning is not running around the circle screening. Um, okay. Like, what are we doing? Uh, so obviously we have to tell you. That's what I've been talking about so far. The notification fees. Well, once we tell you you can't be here, we have to prevent people from coming in, right? So that's the part he's telling you about that we're not going to let you back in. This is a number one priority, telling you that there's a problem, but then followed closely by we can't let people come back into the hazard area. There's also going to be people who are trapped by the hazard. It might be a flood, it might be a landslide, it might be a fire. So we're doing rescues. 
We also have to do traffic flow. Does anybody remember the Blue Bell Fire where we shut down Evergreen quite effectively, quite quickly? So that's what happens when you don't give proper instructions to the public and you send it to a huge audience that's not affected by it. And we all know downtown Evergreen is everybody comes in and they meet in the middle and they sit there and stare at each other. So part of that is managing the traffic flow. Does that mean we, uh, not so much for this area, but we take over the traffic signals and we manage the traffic? Do we set up roadblocks, whatever? Do we have more outbound lanes? The question I always get from the mountain folks is, are you going to shut down 285 so we can all leave and nobody else can come up here? The answer is very likely no. Um, the problem is not with 285. Even in the largest fires, Hayman, where we've evacuated tens of thousands of people, um, that was never an issue. The issue is right here in your neighborhood. You getting up to Parmalee is probably the biggest adventure you're going to have from your neighborhood. So it's actually from your house to your artery that is the hazard area for traffic congestion. Uh, when I was evacuating during Lower North Fork, the number one priority for a portion of that was getting a horse trailer that was jackknifed across the one way in, one way out road out of the way. And we did. It wasn't pretty, but we got it out of it. So traffic flow is a huge thing. And then providing that security piece. So I've got a, a law enforcement officer in the field at the instant command post with the fire guys, and this is what they're working on uh, all at once. All people who need transportation, all <coughs> So other things that are going on. So now we're looking at what am I doing in emergency management. So by definition, if I boot you out of your house, I have to give you some place to go. So the first place we give you is an evacuation center. So I need to clarify that. People don't like to show up to evac centers because they get that confused with shelters. Evacuation centers are provided to give you some place to go to get information. So if you want to know what's going on with my house, what's going on with the incident, that's where you go. You could watch the news as well, but they're getting a trickle-down information that's later. You're sitting there with us, and we're telling you what's going on. So I put a PIO there to answer your questions. Victim Services is there, uh, providing behavioral health. We usually do food, uh, you know, some snacks and some water. Um, but it's really about getting information. So evac centers are not what you see in the hurricanes where there's thousands of people sitting there in this gym. That's not an evacuation center. Uh, it's usually a room much like this, set up much like this. We're projecting information on here. You're talking to our PIO, getting information. And we usually do it at schools. If we have to, we will open up shelters. We always open up shelters for uh, pets and animals. That's an automatic thing. And then if we have to, if we go long enough, we'll open up uh, a human shelter. And they might be in the same building, but they are not the same thing. So if, say this was uh, Conifer High School, this might be the evacuation center and maybe the gym is where we're doing the shelter. And so you might be staying with friends or family, or staying in a hotel, but for your information, you're going to that evac center, and if you just don't have a place to go, then you can stay overnight in the shelters, and we provide food there as well. We're also working on mass transportation assistance. So maybe the Geneva Glendon camp up here had some big showdown going and had hundreds of kids that we need to evacuate. So one of the things we're doing is I'm pulling buses and arranging for transportation. Uh, assistance for that. Sometimes the roads are blocked and we're calling in aircraft to do evacuations of people. We're working on that public information piece because we just made everybody leave so now we have to give them updated information on that and that's a huge thing. Uh, and the reason why we focus so much on that public information is what is everybody's reaction when they don't know what's going on besides social media and complaining about it. They call 911. And our 911 centers are overwhelmed by everything going on with an incident uh, plus everything else that's going on in the entire county, because that doesn't stop. Uh, and you know, people just don't respect that, hey, you know, there's a big event going on. Maybe this barking dog is not a huge to do. They will still call us for that. So we provide that information so that people are not calling 911 to get that information. And then the other thing we're doing, which is a huge thing, is we're already planning for you to go back. So our goal is to get you back as quickly as possible, but we're planning. There's a lot that goes in, into that. You know, is it safe to go back in? We have to inspect the areas. Is the road open? Do you have power? Uh, so on and so forth. So what should you guys be doing as members of the public? So first of all, register with Code Red. 
is uh, one of our most effective ways of getting a hold of you. And answer the phone so you join the 30% instead of <laughs> staying in the 70%. Download the app. He's going to talk about your own evac and reunification plan. So my little spin on this is uh, know what you want to take, have a way to get that. But those of us who have families, um, it's a little more complicated. For me, it's easy. I just have to worry about me. But typically what happens, you're at work, kids are at home because they got bused home from school, now you can't get back up there, and you don't have a plan. So there should be a plan for that, that reunification piece. So if it happens earlier in the day, then we actually have a plan in place with our own schools, and we just tell them where we're evacuating, and they hold all those kids at the school, and they will call you and say, we have the kids, this is where you're going to go pick them up. And they will take care of them until you get there. Uh, but if they're already out of school and they're home, now you have to have a plan. Are the neighbors going to evacuate them, take them to the evac center? Where are you guys going to run to? So in the survivalist world, it's a, when we bug out, where are we going to meet up? That's what your reunification needs, just kind of in a fancier. Learn all of your state routes. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, that's one of the most amusing things of 25 years of law enforcement is how few people actually know more than one way to their house. Uh, more city folk than mountain folk. But if I do a, a traffic control point because there's a traffic accident or something and people can't get through, there's a high percentage of people who literally will sit there because I am blocking the only way possible to their house. And I will offer suggestions of alternative routes to get them there in 30 more seconds. No, this is the way I go. So, yeah. Know the routes out. And maybe you know I only have one route out. Um, I did this presentation and I had a lady said, would you be opposed to me rappelling down a cliff down to the road? <laughs> and I said, no, it'd kind of be fun to watch. But she, her house was up on a cliff, and she only had one way out or rappel down the cliff to where the road was and hope somebody would pick her up. So I hope she doesn't have to implement plan B, but she has a plan B, even in a one way in, one way out. Uh, also, please follow the instructions that we give you uh, and do so quickly. Please don't be part of that, hey, he told me I have a minimum of 30 minutes before I had to leave because that's the national statistic. That's not why I shared that with you. Uh, I'm sharing that with you to so you go, well, yeah, if you're about to die, why would you wait 30 minutes? Evac means now, pre-evac means actively prepared. So that's the difference. If we say evacuate, there's no prepping, it's just leaving. And only use 911 for emergencies, not for information. If you want to know what keeps me up at night as an emergency manager, I don't sit there worrying about dams failing. I don't worry about wildfires starting. What I worry about is failures of the public notification system because that's what most often kills people in incidents. Um, I review every large scale incident and what are the failures in that public information. And we change our plan all the time. Sheriff, I drive him crazy. Because, you know, why are we, we're changing it again? We just changed this a few months ago. We're like, well, we had another big fire, and people screwed up, and I'm fixing it. Uh, and not us, but, like, the campfire in Paradise, and all these different incidents. We learned from that. So at first, in Paradise, they all said, well, they had a horrible evac plan. It wasn't the evac plan. It was the notification system. And the reality was, there was no physical way they could notify those people quickly enough to get them out. So there was no winning that situation. So... Notifications is what keeps me up at night, and um, with that, any questions for my piece? Sir? Um, I just wondered, is there a um, exact name of our area that would be um, on the code red? Um, That's going to be Or is that by you to determine, and when you do that, do you define? So, uh, if you're using the app, you're going to see actually on, remember that map I showed you? Yeah. If you use the app, you actually see the map. So that's one of the reasons I love using the app, because I can see exactly who they're talking to. Uh, but we are very generic, uh, because sometimes if you get too specific, people don't know. Um, if you ask a lot of people, what's the name of your neighborhood, they don't really know. Um, and a lot of them, especially in cities, are cryptic. It's like, Westlake Meadows filing number eight. And we don't send out that specific. So for you guys, it's going to say Indian Hills. Um, 
Well, even GPS calls us Evergreen, calls us Morrison, calls us Indian Hill. Right. So. And if it's coming over, you know, if it's coming through our code red notification system to you, it's going to be at an address you're registered to, so it applies to you. So if you're using the app, that's where you're going to look at the map and say, oh, well, I'm close, but I'm not in that area. But if we are calling you directly, you are, now you just have to remember, are you registered at multiple addresses? So for me, that's easy. If Arvada is calling me, I know they're calling my house. And if Golden's calling me, they're calling my office. That's how I differentiate because I know the jurisdictions. But uh, if you're registering multiple addresses, that's where you have to do a little thinking, which is why, really why we throw that in there. Because what they used to say was in your area. What does that yeah. mean? Does that mean where I'm at right now or where I'm registered? And people aren't going to, in their panic state, logically deduce all those things. So be careful if you register multiple addresses because you will have that issue. So does this mean we've gotten rid of the level one, level two, level three termination? Yes. Or terminology. 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 Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, if not for the public, then for us. I actually have radio traffic of law enforcement people discussing <laughs> what, that means. what they want. You know, is, is three worse or is one worse? So what did that always end up being? It was always a level two because that was a safe middle ground. So, so I despised that from the moment it came out, and I had no idea that fast forward a few years and I would be eliminating that. Uh, but actual federal guidelines say we use plain English, we don't use cryptic terminology. Um, so level one, two, three means nothing to you. But if I say evacuate, oh, well now I get it. So and level one dispatch hated because that was the number one provoker of 911. So, level of my, yeah. As soon as that was going up, they're like, oh, now the phones are going to ring off. Anything else? I will be here at the end if you think of something or you just don't want to announce it to the world. Thanks, Greg. So I, I want to highlight two things that are just so, just so everybody understands. So we're, we're in an unincorporated Jefferson County. We have a community name and we have some special districts to provide support, the fire protection district and the water district. But at the end of the day, County is the one that runs and activates and has the authority to issue evacuations and that sort of stuff. The sheriff does actually. The sheriff actually statutorily in the, in the Colorado Constitution is the fire marshal, warden, whatever the term is, I can't remember, for all the unincorporated area of the county. So, so he gets rolled right into the fire response piece as well as evacuation notification and everything else associated with that. And that's hard to understand sometimes, but that's the umbrella that we then operate under, and that's why, that's why Gray's here talking through all this stuff. So it's the way that the county operates in terms of issuing, supporting, and then, and then conducting those evacuations and sheltering sites and so on and so forth. So, and the second thing I want to emphasize is register for code red, okay? It's really easy. It, it'll, it'll pop you a thunderstorm warning and stuff like that. You're sitting over there at Costco or wherever you're at. At least you know what's going on. I mean, I can't tell you the value of it when you know, I'm down there all the time, you know, doing, doing my day job, and I realize my dog's going crazy because it's, it's thunderstorm in my house. I can't do anything about that, necessarily. But the point is, it's a very valuable tool, but you've got to register for it. If you don't register, okay, then you're not going to get it, and it's going to go to the other blocks of notification systems above that. So, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You get a text. You can, if you don't want phone calls, just get texts. Just get text message to your phone. And then you at least know what's happening and going on. So, so the other uh, the other special district is the water district here in, in, in our community. So I wanted to give Chris just a minute to talk through what those impacts of this kind of event might be. And then we'll get Mike to talk about what we can do to get ready for it. Um, I think I know a few people here in the room, but some faces are new. Uh, my name is Kristen Waters. I'm the general manager at Indian Hills Water District. And just to be very brief, we have three main goals at the Water District. Water quality, fire protection, and managing our infrastructure and resources. So when we're talking about fire protection, our number one job is to produce enough water, keep enough water in storage, to be able to assist in, in providing water when they need to fight fires. So we have 474,000 gallons of water storage within our district that is available for an emergency of this kind. 
Um, we are constantly working to produce enough water to keep those tanks full. And when we have a good year like this, that is not really a problem. When we have a dry year like last year, that can be a problem. So we need to um, ask our community. We're, we, it's a team effort. We're working with the fire department. We keep the lines of communication open. But we also need to ask our community to keep an eye out for leaks. Watch for leaks on your property. Watch for leaks in the district. Watch for leaks inside your home. Because that can drain a tank just like that. We had that happen in January. And we don't want to see that happen again. So we need everybody to participate. But what I have to point out is that if there is an evacuation situation, we as uh, water district employees may or may not be allowed to go to the water district treatment plants. So they will remain running as long as, they're, as they have power. So if the fire district needs to you know, use some of the water from the storage tanks by opening up a fire hydrant or whatever they need to do, the plant should keep putting out water to, to keep those full. But if we lose power, you know, our, my main job is going to be to communicate with our community and let people know, okay, we're now under conservation due to whatever the emergency situation is. So we will um, make sure to keep people um, notified just like you guys do. Um, I can send out emails. I can say, please talk to your neighbors and, and get that information out to you. But if there were to be a fire, a forest fire or a wildland fire here, the, there's a short-term plan and a long-term plan. If we have a fire that destroys a um, large number of acres, we could end up you know, with um, a runoff situation that could contaminate wells. So we would continue to stay in communication to let you guys know. We would increase our water testing. We would do everything we need to do to make sure that the water we're putting out is safe. So that's what we've got. Yeah. Uh, all right. That's a, oh, I got a yeah, controller. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Really thanks for here. All right. So thanks everybody. You're stuck with me because the rest of all my department just left to go assist uh, <laughs> our neighboring agency with motor vehicle accident they were working. So my name is Mike Pasula. I'm the department wildland lieutenant. And I'm here in Indian Hills, and I wanted to piggyback a little bit on, on what we're talking about tonight to really talk about the threat of wildfire in our community, a little bit about how we deal with fire, how we sort of think about fire, and then most importantly, what you can do um, in terms of mitigation and preparation, and then also a little bit, um, I'll dovetail into the, the getting ready for the evacuation piece as well. So, if you have any questions, just stop me, raise your hand. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, more than happy to answer your questions as they come up. So I wanted to throw out some national statistics. Uh, I think we all know this, we talked about the campfire, paradise fire. Uh, we, we talk about the WUI, the W-U-I, that's the Wildland Urban Interface, okay? So that's the area, that's my daughter, um, that's the area, and she knows what the WUI is, right? Um, they, that's the area where wildland fuels abut human development, right? So basically an area where we have forest and the community comes together. And if you think about Indian Hills, that's essentially our entire community. We talk about up here, every structure fire we have is a potential wildland fire, and every wildland fire is a potential structure fire, right? So some national statistics. We burn about four, almost four and a half million acres in the U.S. average annually every year. Um, I went back for the last couple of years where there's records for this stuff. 2014, uh, we had about an average year. Uh, we burned four million acres, but we lost 1,900 structures in the United States. So 1,900 structures were burned by wildfire in the United States. The next year, we had a really dry year uh, nationally. We burned 10 million acres. Um, it was the worst fire season in decades up until then. We topped it. Um, one fire alone, Valley Fire in California, burned 2,000 structures. Okay, one fire. Um, in 2016, we still had an above average year, although it wasn't 10 million, uh, relatively slow compared to the year before. And then in 2017, we had a banner year for burning down uh, structures, unfortunately. We burned 10 million acres, um, tying the worst season ever in terms of acres, but we burned 10,000 homes down, okay, in 2017. That was the most, yes, honey? I'm good, I don't need a drink, thank you, though. Um, so that was, that's the most recent years in which I could find statistics. According to the National Volunteer Fire Council, more than 72,000 communities in the United States are at risk for wildfire. 72,000 communities. That's not 72,000 homes. That's not 72,000 um, people. That's 72,000 communities. Each of those communities are hundreds of thousands of homes, right? Um, 
In the United States, I, that was going to be a trivia question, and I should have hit that so fast. Where do you think we rank? So we rank number three, if anybody was reading ahead, in terms of the most endangered state, in terms of the danger that wildfire um, impacts on, on our communities. Um, here they are, the 10 most wildfire-prone states. Again, this data is about two years old, because that's the most recent I could find published. Uh, everybody knows California is probably number one in the United States. Uh, Texas is actually second. Over here is by the number of households, and over here is by the percentage of households. There's Colorado. Whether you measure by uh, the number of households or the percentage of total, and either way, we're number three in the nation. So that's a big, that's a big number, right? Um, 366,000 homes in the state of Colorado are at high or extreme danger of wildfire. That's one in every six homes in the state. Right, is either in what they consider a high or extreme, those are the two highest categories um, for wildfire danger in, in, uh, in Colorado. So it's here. Why do we lose so many homes? Um, this picture, unfortunately, this picture I took uh, down on the uh, Black Forest Fire, where we lost a bunch of structures, and that was one of the structures we lost. Um, we have more homes and people in what we call the WUI, the Wild and Urban Interface. Where does everybody want to live? Everybody wants to live up here. Everybody wants to live in the mountains. Everybody wants, everybody wants to have a beautiful view with a lot of trees, right? We have more homes and we have more people in areas that are in danger. We have larger and more frequent fires. We saw those statistics we burned 10 million acres a couple years ago nationwide, right? <clears throat> Why do we have more fires? We have drought, we have climate change, and, and this one's our fault, right? We have what's called fire exclusion and suppression. What does that mean? That means we're too good at what we do, right? We put fires out very aggressively. The, the Forest Service used to have something called the 10 a.m. policy, right? Every fire had to be out by 10 o'clock the next morning, right? It was reported at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If it wasn't out by 10 o'clock the next morning, that was somebody screwed up, right? The problem with that is fires are naturally occurring. And when we don't fight fire, uh, I'm sorry, when we do fight fire and we don't allow it to burn, um, we build up this, these fuels, right? The things that burn, the trees, the brush, all that stuff. And it doesn't get, um, you don't do a lot of mechanical thinning, unfortunately. Um, so we have a lot of fuels that grow up from that. Now, unfortunately, we can't let fires burn near homes, right? So it's kind of a catch-22. Um, and lack of public outreach, right? That's what we're trying to fix that piece right now by talking to you about this. All right. How do we look at wildfire? I thought it would be helpful if we talked just briefly about how the fire department looks at fires, because I'm going to tell you sort of, what are you two doing? <laughs> okay, sit down, please. Um, those are my two kids. Um, because I thought that might be helpful to you when we talk about how to mitigate your properties. We have three things that influence fire behavior. Let me go back. When we talk about fire behavior, I mean, what is the fire going to do? How is the fire going to grow? Where is it going to move? Where is it going to go? Those three things are fuels, weather, and topography, right? What are fuels, right? The things that burn, grass, shrubs, trees, structures, right? These are all fuels. Um, and then we talk about the arrangements of fuels and fuel moisture. If we have dense fuels, a bunch of brush that's really close together, is that more likely to carry fire? Sure, right? If those fuels are dry, those are going to be, going to be more likely to carry fire, right? Talk about weather. Um, everybody knows this sort of intuitively, that when it's hot and dry outside, it's a, it's a high fire day today, right? Wind, temperature, humidity, things like that influence the fire behavior. And topography. Anybody want to guess, does fire burn faster uphill or down? Uh -huh. Up, right? Okay. Unless the wind is blowing really strong downhill. Right? Um, so those are kinds of the things we think about. So we've got a, an area with a lot of fuel, dense fuel, dense vegetation. It's really dry, it's really hot, it's really windy, and it's hilly. That for us is sort of like the disaster scenario, right? So when you look at your own properties, when you look at your community, when you think about what could possibly happen in terms of a fire and how to prepare for that, think about those things. <coughs> if my house is at the top of the bridge, and a fire starts in the canyon, there's a pretty good chance that's going to impact me pretty quickly, right? If I live at the bottom of the mountain and the fire is the single tree lightning strike all the way at the top, maybe I've got a little bit longer to deal with that, right? Cool. And then we're talking about slope and aspect and stuff like that. So then we, there's this guy uh, called Jack Cohen. He's a, a researcher in uh, California. And he came up with this idea called the home ignition zone. And what is that, right? What is it? What he basically did was, looked at the structure and looked at the area around the structure and said, what is it about the area around this structure that's going to cause the structure to catch fire, right? We've all seen these videos in the news. This is like the biggest thing on the news. You see like this giant flame front. The flames are like 300 feet high and this flame front's burning towards a neighborhood, right? Believe it or not, that's not what burns your homes down, usually. 
not those, not those flames themselves. Those big giant 300 foot tall flame fronts, they move through pretty quickly, right? Those flames themselves aren't usually what sets the structures on fire. What sets the structures on fire is the embers that come off of them, the ember storms, right? Um, so let's talk about let's talk about fuels. Some fuels are obviously more flammable than others. We talk about density and growth and accumulation. This is a big one, right? Who checks their gutters all the time to make sure they're not full of pine needles, right? Who's got the deck good? Who's got the deck that sticks out from the house? The ground slopes away. It's not closed, and every fall, all the leaves and pine needles blow in there, right? Who's got that? Um, we were on a fire, the Black Forest fire down in uh, down in the Springs, 2012, I think it was. And somebody had had the bright idea that they would store bales of hay on their pat on their de back deck. <laughs> Probably not what you want to be doing, right? Um, we talk about continuous and non-continuous fuels, right? If I have a tree here and a tree here and a tree here, and all the branches are touching, and the fire's coming through, what's that fire going to do, right? It's going to continue to come through that area. If I've got a tree over here and a tree over there, and the canopies, we talk about the, the canopies, the, the branches, they're not touching each other. <coughs> it's less likely that that fire is going to continue through there, or at least not with the intensity and the speed that it would otherwise, right? So there's all sorts of things you should start to think about. When I look at my property, what are the things that I can do to maybe protect it a little bit? Well, maybe if I don't have trees that are touching each other all the way up to my house, you know? We'll get into that in a little bit more detail here in a minute. We're talking about this thing called ladder fuels. This is like a fire department term. And think about climbing a ladder, right? The fire does the same thing. If you've got a tree, and the lowest branch is this far off the ground, and then you've got continuous branches all the way up to the top of the tree, the fire's going to climb that like a ladder. So one of the things we tell people they can do is to, to limb the tree up to 9 or 10 feet, right, so the fire can't get a start on that, on that ladder. Right? I'll go into these in a little bit more detail in a minute. And then there's the things we put in the, so this home ignition zone, just basically this box around our house. The things we put there, right, Decorative landscaping, man-made materials. So the cushions for your patio furniture that are like all sorts of, I don't know, poly awful bad stuff, we call it in the fire service, right? Mm. It's, a, it's a, a synthetic material that basically burns like gasoline, right? These are things that maybe we need to think about. When I look at a home, it's unfortunate when you do this for as long as I've done it. When I look at a home, I look at fuel. I think about, oh, it's a beautiful home. I don't like where that tree is, right? Or, or I wish they didn't store their lawnmower gas can next to their front door, right? Like, these are all things that we think about. So we want you to kind of do the same thing. Um, I think this is, uh, I don't know which fire that is, but anyway, that's, that's that giant flame front that I was talking about. So how do structures ignite? Flame fronts versus ember storms. I had a video that I was going to show, but I don't have an internet. Do we have an internet connection? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, this, so I might be able to show you this video here in a second. But this is what the NVFC said, that embers coming into contact with flammable material is the major reason why homes are destroyed by wildfire. Let me see if I can make this video play, because it's, it's fairly interesting. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this up here. I'm going to try that. So if I... Scott, is this your? Yeah. I've got a window open here, but I can't seem to get it. So I can see it on here, but not on there, so I don't know. It's escape. It's escape. I guess I gotta go back to the presentation and yeah. escape, right? I'll try it. Okay. I don't know what. with me here. All right. Now let's try this. All right. So this is going to be a little thing about how your home ignites. Okay. Kind of hoping we have sound. So. Um, I don't even know if there is sound, but basically they, they built this house. They have this fire chamber. It's like a building. It's this giant concrete building. And they burn stuff inside. It's probably the coolest place in the world. The fire, the fire, the fire. And they're going to show you. So they built this home um, in this chamber. They have these 
things that generate embers, and they've got these giant fans that simulate the wind. And I just want to, I won't bore you with this for too long, but I want to show you this. So essentially, they've, they've built a home, they've, they've landscaped it. It's only about a four minute piece of so. sun. Coolest thing ever. Materials to build part of it, they did fiber siding, part of it they did vinyl, and then the roof you saw was also part of it was an old fashioned wood sheet roof, and part of it was asphalt sheet. Roof. Notice the vegetation right around the building. So the attic gable vent, we tell people to put screens over here, they did that. You're still going to see. Quite a bit of embers coming into the attic. This is obviously shocking the inside of the structure. They didn't furnish the homes, it didn't have like couches and stuff inside of it. Um, you could imagine though, if the house did have furnishings in it, those all would have gone up a little faster. So it burned through the um, window screen. Yeah, right, that's the other thing, it's curtains. Yeah, I'll talk about that. So anyway, I wanted to show you that video. That home, you know, unfortunately for us, when we go on a wildland fire, a lot of times, um, we don't bring our structural firefighting gear with us, um, nor do we have the capacity to do that. Um, if we have an area where there's 50 homes that are potentially impacted, we can't. You know, our objective is to keep the homes from catching fire. Once they're on fire, unfortunately, there's not a whole heck of a lot we can do. If we have your home catches on fire, you have a structure fire, we'll come put it out, that's no problem. What I'm saying is if we have a large wildfire event, it's unlikely that we can fight individual structure fires. Our general rule is if more than a quarter of the roof is on fire, we're not gonna try to put that out. Right? Our type six brush truck holds about 350 gallons of water. We would need about 10 times that to put that fire out. We don't have air packs, we're not gonna go inside. Um, so that's for us, in, in a scenario like this. We're trying to get the homes to keep from catching on fire, right? And that's what we're, that's what I'm trying to show you here tonight. So let me go back to this. And I'm not completely technically illiterate. Um, so here's that home ignition zone, right? And, and, and Professor Cohen, um, who's a firefighter for a long time in the Forest Service, he came up with this. And he built these different zones. You can, you can Google this, you can look at this. Um, 
he's got three different zones, and uh, the reason being there's different things that you can do to mitigate each one of those zones. Zero to five feet from the structure, five to 30 feet, and 30 feet to whatever that furthest, usually say 100 to 200 feet from the structure. So we talk about these fuels, right? What are the fuels around our homes, right? Pine needles, uh, pine duff, you can read. Um, all the things that you think about outside that can burn, some of which we put there, like wood piles, and the guy that decided it was a good idea to stack um, hay bales on his deck. I think this guy was actually trying to burn his house down. Um, that's the only reasonable explanation I can come up with. Um, the gas can from the lawnmower, right? The propane tank from the barbecue. These are all things that we put there. There you go. I got ahead of myself. Um, all right. There's three, or we call, talk about defensible space. What is defensible space? That means creating space around your home that you and we can use to defend that structure from wildfire, right? So there's three R's. Remove, reduce, and replace. So remove things that can be removed. Dead and dying grass, shrubs, trees, um, other flammable materials. Lean, clean, and green is what they talk about, right? Some of this isn't as applicable up here as it is in Kentucky, but that's what we're shooting for. We I mean, reduce, right? If we can't remove it, we want to reduce it. We're going to reduce the density of the vegetation. Oh, the grass, right? Prune the trees. Um, creating both horizontal and vertical separation. We talked about those ladder fuels, right? If you don't want to cut down the tree that's near your house because you like it, I know that I've got houses, trees near my house that I don't want to cut down because I like them too, at least limb them up. Cut off the limbs from the bottom of the tree so that if there is a ground fire, it doesn't get up into the tree. Um, and then horizontal separation, right? Ideally, those trees shouldn't be touching each other. Because if there's a fire in one tree, maybe we can contain it to that tree rather than having it spread. And then replace, right? We talk about trying to use things that are less flammable around our homes, right? Having the pine bark mulch that looks really nice right up against the foundation of your home, probably not the best place for that, right? Use rocks instead if you want to have some sort of decorative landscape. That's just one. Idea. So the immediate zone is the area right around your home from touching the home to five feet out, right? What are the things we can do? Um, you know, I can read you this whole thing, but basically we want to remove, the object here is to create a non-combustible area right around the structure, right? Don't have vegetation right there. Um, don't have gutters full of dead leaves. Um, repair missing shingles or roof tiles. Um, talked about that one-eighth inch metal mesh screening, right? Put that up. You saw that it's not a panacea, right? It did, there, there were some members coming through that. Um, but it's something to think about. Um, the big thing that I've seen on a lot of fires I've been on is the, that area under the deck, right? The, the ground slopes away, so I've got this cool area under my deck that I can use to store stuff, and that becomes like a catch-all for all kinds of crap. Um, some of which is very flammable, that folks got their wood piles under there, and all sorts of stuff. Um, Loose window screens, broken windows, all that kind of stuff. Remove flammable material away from the exterior of the home. Mulch, flammable plants, leaves. Patio furniture is great if it's made of non-combustible material. Um, even wood patio furniture isn't really that much more flammable than the rest of the structure. But it's that cushion that's on there, right? It's essentially made from gasoline <laughs> in solid form um, that's going to that's gonna catch on fire. And what we tell folks is, that's fine, you want to have your deck chair out there, but if it's got a flammable cushion on it, when you're not using it, throw it in the shed, throw it in the garage, right? Don't leave that out there to catch an ember. Any questions so far? I'm kind of going through this quickly. Um, I adapted this from a longer presentation, so. Um, the structure itself, right? Think about your house. When you look at your house, think about, is, how, is this going to catch fire and how? Um, ideally, we want stuff to be non-flammable. I don't think anybody has a wood shed, right? It's a wood shed. Um, but things like not leaving your windows open, um, having dual pane windows, you mentioned having the curtains, right? If you have flammable curtains, um, maybe it's best to push those away from the window, right? Um, rather than um, and draw the, if you have metal shades, blinds, don't draw those down when you leave the house. Um, they make uh, vents that are uh, ember resistant, both for your dryer and for your attic. You can buy those and replace the ones that aren't. Um, the eaves of the roof, like the, even even the, the um, what do you call it, the hip roof, is that what it's called? Like basically the valley in the yeah. roof, that, that's a catch-all for all kinds of stuff, right? Pine needles and leaves and stuff like that accumulate in there. Get up there, clean that stuff out. 
um, and try to make stuff out of non-combustible material, especially if it's right around your home. And the hazardous material storage is the other one, right? Who's got the gasoline can, the plastic gasoline can from the, from the tractor that's like sitting next to the house or the propane tank from the, from the barbecue, right? Guilty of that one. Um, you know, maybe the best idea for that is don't store that right next to your house. Um, Here's a big one. Make sure your address is visible. Um, we've got the signs that we do. Uh, make sure we can find you. Make sure law enforcement can find you. Whether that's a fire, whether that's a medical. Medical is a big one, right? We've got to call in the middle of the night at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know, blah, blah, blah road. We need to be able to find you. And trust me, the GPSs don't know which way. Um, they'll get us close. Uh, clean the debris. We talked about that. Cover the vent openings. Eaves and soffits. Again, you can get combustible resistant, I'm sorry, ignition or non-combustible, exist, sorry, ignition resistant or non-combustible material for that. Um, decks within 10 feet of the building should be built of non-combustible materials. You know, kind of take that with a grain of salt. If you have a wood deck, I'm not telling you to rip it off. Um, but ideally, um, don't have carpet on it. Um, remove flammable materials such as patio furniture, toys, kids, toys. Um, put those inside. Propane tanks are another one we talked about, right? So these are all things we can do. Um, so this is the intermediate zone. This is sort of like that next step out. <clears throat> yeah, that's immediate. This is intermediate. So this is 5 to 30 feet from the structure. In this case, I don't think we can create a fireproof, you know, that we can't exclude all flammable material from 30 feet from our home. But we can maintain a landscape that, if ignited, will not let readily transmit fire, right? What does that mean? Um, you got that big bulk propane tank somewhere. Don't have the grass grown right underneath that. Um, seeing that, um, create fuel breaks, uh, mow the grass, prune the trees, space trees to have 18 feet between the crowns, right? That's on flat ground. So again, not only are the trees not touching each other, but ideally the closest branch on this tree to the closest branch on this tree, there's 18 to 20 feet between those, right? Yes, sir. And what about that, uh, that stuff they're making for decks out of recycled plastic? Yeah, I was going to mention that. Is that as flammable as, I mean, Do you know that's the answer that? made yeah. out of petroleum? It right? is essentially made out of petroleum. My guess is, and I've not seen studies on that, is that it's, uh, it's, it's probably more flammable than similar product made out of wood, just solid wood. Mm -hmm. You know, people like it for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you not to use it, but it is something to think about. And if I were building a deck on my home with that, I would research that to the manufacturer. Um, you know, um, you put your right, it is essentially made out of gasoline, just like your, your patio furniture cushions. Um, you know, keep the keep the trees away from the structure too. Like keep them away from each other. Keep them away from the structure, um, and don't have continuous fuels. Right? I've been on a fire where someone had like some sort of creeping juniper or something like that, and it was a continuous bed of this stuff from you know 100 feet away from the structure right up to the, to the structure. If a flame gets in that, it's going to carry that fire right to your house. Right? We don't want that. And then there's that extended zone. So this is beyond 30 feet from your home. Um, um, so the objective here, and again, we know that there, there could be a fire in this area. We've accepted that. We're going to try to reduce the intensity and the speed of that fire. Get rid of those heavy accumulations of ground debris, those slash piles. Jeffco's doing a slash collection here, I think, uh, just coming up soon, right? Yep. Yeah, um, next week, there's going to be a slash collection, so take advantage of that. Um, remove dead material. Um, remove those small trees growing between the big trees that are going to carry the fire. Um, again, I, you can read all this stuff. I can send you the presentation. But, but basically, the further away from the building, from the structure that trees are, the closer they can be to each other. I'm not telling you to go half a mile into the woods and start felling trees. Um, but ideally, if a tree is within 100 feet of your house, it's in that home ignition zone, and we should try to keep that canopy from being continuous, right? All right, so now I'll talk a little bit more about the evacuation piece. Any questions on that before I move on? All right, cool. Oh, yeah, somebody back there is now. We were going to go over this. Yeah. Uh, like, how quickly does this typically happen? I so it felt like, like it, I can get out of the wildfire. Yeah, you I think, think so, California right? There's some California things that maybe are making doubt that. Yeah, so if anybody didn't hear the question, the question was how quickly do these fires spread, right? And the answer is it depends. Um, on a bad day, really fast. Faster than you can run. Faster than we can run. Um, really fast. Faster than you think. 
and, and that's what I would tell you, is if, if you're looking at a fire that's coming towards your house and you think you've got however much time you think you have, cut it in half. You should probably don't have that much time. Now, it's been raining, it's been, it's been damp, you know, we think about low fire danger this year. The truth is, by having all this moisture, what we've done is we've created a lot of fuel, right? We have a lot of fuel that's grown up. If this rain stops, all of a sudden our fire danger goes way up, right? And those fuels dry out. We have, um, the county does it, as well as the uh, Forest Service. They go out and they sample fuel moistures, and they send those out in an email. Every couple of weeks I get an email from your guys or from the Forest Service guys that say this is what the fuel moistures look like. Believe it or not, the last one I got, which was like a week and a half ago, those fire, those fuel moistures were starting to dry out, and those fire dangers were already creeping up, just based on like going a week without rain. So, in those types of conditions, pretty damn quick, unfortunately. I, I can't answer your question because it's not; it's very variable, but it's a good question. So, you have this thing called ready, set, go. Um, and this is basically, um, if you have to evacuate, right, what are the steps that you should take? Hey, there's a fire engine in the parking lot. Um, so talk about ready, right? What's the ready part of race I go? Ready part is what we've already talked about. Signing up for code red, mitigating your property, creating defensible space, becoming situationally aware, right? We talked about it a lot before. Situational awareness, what's going on around you? Set is the part we'll talk about now. Um, creating an action plan, right? Evacuation planning for your family, your pets, an emergency kit. Guys, guys excuse me. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's hard, being a parent or being a lieutenant of the fire department. Sometimes it's the same thing, right? Um, <laughs> fill out a communication plan that includes uh, evacuation and contact information, and make sure everybody knows about that. Guys, could you go back? Go back. Go back. Um, Fill out a communication plan that includes information and contact information. Make sure everybody knows that, right? A plan is a great plan, but if you don't communicate that plan, it's just the best not happening, right? And then the go is the part we're talking about. That's the leave it, right? When you get that call to evacuate, what are the things I need to do, right? Well, I already have a checklist, right? Because I created a, an action plan with a checklist. That what are the things that I'm going to take with me, right? I have that kit. I've already put it in my vehicle because I got the pre-evacuation notice. It's already packed, right? Now we talk about actually getting out of there, right? Cover up if the fire's that close that it's, you have to dress like this guy. Um, <laughs> cover up to protect yourself from heat and flying embers. Wear long pants, right? Shorts are great in summer. Not so good when you're trying to get away from a fire. Um, long sleeve shirt, heavy shoes, boots, caps. I and mean, think about what we wear when we go to a fire, right? I'd love to be able to wear shorts on a fire until I got near the fire and then I realized what a horrible decision that was. Um, cotton's better than uh, synthetics, right? Synthetics melt, cotton burns eventually, but it doesn't melt. And uh, obviously take your pets with you. We talked about it. Everybody loves their pets, right? Is there anything, if we did have to evacuate, that we should do to our houses, like yes. turn off the Absolutely. electricity and gas? Yes. I think I left that slide in, but if I took it out, I'll talk about it. So if I don't say it, remind me, but I think I'm going to cover that. Great question. All right, so here's the ready. This is just basically, this is actually uh, Indian Hills. This is a, a structure before and after we, they did some uh, fire mitigation. We already talked about this, so we'll skip that. Here's the set. Okay, here's my evacuation plan. What is my evacuation plan? It's a detailed plan. Um, gives me a location outside where I'm going to be. Maybe, maybe the county's going to tell me where the evacuation center is, right? Maybe I'm going to go to a friend's house. And the key is to think about this stuff ahead of time, right? Have a plan that includes your pets and your large animals. And that takes more time. If you've got horses, start you know, thinking about that ahead of time. I'll pack his order with the giant animals that he has on. Um, and then a family communication plan. We talked about You touched on this a little bit. Who are we going to get in touch with? What's our, you know, we're going to bug out, right? Where are we going? How are we going to get back in touch with each other? If everybody knows we're going to call so-and-so, we're going to meet at this place, everybody has everybody else's phone numbers, we can make that work. Um, think about the fact that you may be separated from your family when this starts. Talk about the scenario before about my kids are at home, but I'm at work. How do I, make, how do I, how do I plan for that, right? Here's your emergency supply kit, right? This is what, um, I got this from Cal Fire. They do a bunch of fire. They used to be CDF, the California Department of Forestry, and so everybody said that's good for can't do fire, so they changed their name to Cal Fire. Um, at any rate, they're awesome firefighters. We like to make fun of them because they're the biggest and the best, but, but they're real good. So this, this is their list. I totally plagiarized it. Um, Three-day supply of non-perishable food. If you're going to an evacuation center, that might be taken care of, but still something you want to think about. 
three gallons of water per person. There you go. Map with evacuation routes, primary and secondary. Do you know the area around your house? Do you know the way out? Do you know how you're going to get out? Okay. Prescription medication or anything that you take. And remember, we might not, we not, you might not be able to get back in for days, right? So take enough of that. Change clothing, right? Not essential, but I don't want to stink. Um, I already stink when I come back from a fire, so. Um, extra eyeglasses or contact lenses, extra set of car keys. There you go, credit cards, cash, traveler's checks, right? Don't count on the fact that there's gonna be enough money. I have like $6 in my wallet right now. You might want to stash some extra things in my TV. Um, you might want to stash some extra cash as part of that emergency kit. A first aid kit, a flashlight, battery powered radio, and batteries that work, right? How many of us have the flashlights and the, ba and the batteries aren't any good? Okay, fortunately those batteries are good. Sanitation supplies, copies of important documents, right? Talk about this. And I think that was great. So you had two things you're going to take with you, the file server that has the electronic copies and this box that's got the hard copies, right? Don't forget pet food in order for the pets, right? All right. When you get that call to go, these are the things we want you to do. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, review your list. Get your kit, your vehicle. If you have to, I mean, if the fire's that close where you're in danger, this is what happened, unfortunately, in the campfire in folks in California. They were trying to evacuate, and they were the fire was on top of them um, before they could do that. Obviously, cover up. Um, we talked about wearing appropriate clothing, taking your pets with you. Um, leave as soon as the evacuation is. Don't take that 30 minute thing like I'm going to reinforce what Grace said. You know, the national standard is it takes you 30 minutes to evacuate when you tell you evacuate. Don't take those 30 minutes. Go. Um, officials will determine the area to be evacuated and the routes to take. That'll be part of that communication. LE is going to be, law enforcement is going to be responsible for that. Um, whoever may be involved. Um, you will be advised of potential evacuations as early as possible. You must take the initiative to stay informed. It's the personal responsibility piece of that, right? As Americans, I think we're getting kind of terrible at this personal responsibility. Um, listen to those announcements. Sign up for Code Red. Reach out to the media. Check the Jeffco Twitter account. Stay informed. Okay. Um, this is if you get a pre-evacuation notice. So we're saying, you're ready to go, but we're not telling you to leave just yet. Um, gather those flammable items. Um, are, we, are we still calling this? Did I still use the right term pre evacuation, right? All right. Get the stuff that's flammable, the seat cushions, the gas cans and stuff, and get them away from the house. Believe it or not, get them inside the house. If the house is already on fire, the house is going to burn. We don't care that there's a gasoline can in your shed, I mean, in your garage, because your garage is going to burn anyway. Um, the idea is to keep it from catching fire in the first place. So ideally, get it far away from the house. If you can't, the garage is in a terrible place. Because uh, at least it's not outside and those embers are going to impact it. Turn off the propane tanks, move them away from the structures. Uh, connect hoses, this is another CAL FIRE thing. Like, that's great if your garden hoses they are. We come with our own hoses, so we may not use it. But um, uh, Don't leave sprinklers or water hoses running. This is the big one, right? That impacts our water pressure, that, that impacts the water district, um, that empties your cistern. Um, all those kinds of things are bad, so don't do that. Um, leave the lights on so your house is visible. Get your supply kit in your car. We even do this with our fire trucks. Back your car in so that you can pull out straight. We always, I always tell our firefighters, when you're driving down the road where there's a fire, you may not be able to see more than you know three or four or five feet in front of the vehicle. But you've got to do a 16-point turn in your driveway to get out when the fire is you know, coming over that ridge top and you're panicked. That's not the time to be doing that 16-point turn, right? Um, carry your car keys, right? Don't I have this thing when my pager goes off and I gotta come here on a call and I can't find my damn car keys, right? Know where your keys are. Um, if possible, position a ladder to the roof used by fire press. Thanks, Cal Fire, but you guys don't really have to do that. Um, again, well ahead of time, you should seal those things up. Um, if you have, I've seen folks that actually have pre cut plywood that match the size of their windows and they can just put them up over the windows. If you want to go that far, that's a great way to go. Um, monitor the situation again. It's that personal responsibility piece. Check on your neighbors. Um, in the Lower North Fork fire, we lost uh, we had two civilian deaths on that fire, and um, you know those were folks that had been told to evacuate and were taking a while. Um, so, uh, if you have time to check on your neighbors, it's probably the neighborly thing to do. Uh, shut the windows, right? Um, but don't lock them so we can get in if we have to. Um, 
remove, and I we talked about this, right? Removing those window shades and curtains, um, close metal shutters if you have them, move fileable furniture to the center of the room, again, if time permits. By the way, nothing that I'm telling you should delay your evacuation. Number one rule, right? This is if you have time to do these things. Shut off the gas, turn off the pilot lights, leave your lights on so we can see your home, we talked about that. Shut off your swamp cooler if you have one, because that, you know, it's just hay up there, blowing the air down into your house, it's like asking for a fire. Um, get your pets, we talked about that about six times. Livestock as well. Have a destination identified. That's either something that we're gonna give you as part of our notification or that you, you're gonna pick on your own. Um, if you become trapped, okay, we're talking about this, hopefully this never happens to anybody here, but if you're trying to evacuate from a fire and you become trapped, um, in a vehicle, park the vehicle somewhere clear of vegetation. Right? I think that makes sense, don't park in the grass. Close the windows. Cover yourself with a blanket. Lie on the vehicle floor. Um, use your phone, call 911, tell us where you are, and, you know, as best as you can so we can try to come get you. Yeah, sure. they can ping your phone too. Yeah, we can, they can do the ping thing on the phone, but I wouldn't count on it. You know, that's, they can triangulate where you are based on the cell towers and stuff like that. It's imprecise. Um, and there's probably a lot of other traffic on the cell towers at the time, so ideally we can find you, but better to let us know where you're at. If you're on foot, God forbid, uh, get to an area that's clear of vegetation. We practice this every year, unfortunately. Um, ditch your depression. Um, lie face down, cover up your body. Use your phone to call 911. Um, and the other thing is protect your airway. We, this is what I teach our firefighters. We do our training every year. The way you die in a fire is from inhaling superheated air, right? Whether that's a structure fire or you're outside in a wildfire. Try to protect your airway. If you're in your home and you can't get out, right? Get your family together. Stay inside, call 911. Keep the doors and windows closed, but unlock again so we can get in. Stay away from outside walls and windows. Fill tubs with things with cold water. I think that's like that well water when someone's having a baby thing. They never actually use it for anything, but um, Cal Fire put it on there and I plagiarized them, so there it is. Um, probably not as much again. Again, there's more concern there with water pressure too, so I'm not sure I would stress that one too much. And then this is the Jeffco evacuation piece. This overlaps with what they already talked about, so I'm, I'm not going to really talk about that because it's already covered that. So basically the idea is there's things that we can do today to protect our homes from fire. There's things that we ought to do today to get ourselves ready. Build an evacuation, uh, you know, that checklist of all the things that I want to take with me. Have that kit, no worm, you know, register for uh, code red, all those things. There's things that I can do when I get the phone call, whether that's the pre-evacuation and I've got some time, or whether that's the get out now evacuation call. Um, that's all I've got. Um, hopefully I covered, I covered it kind of quickly, but um, try to be respectful of their best time tonight. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that gives you an idea of it. Any questions? All right. The other thing I will say is we're happy to come out and look at your property from perspective of mitigation. We've already done a couple in the community. Um, if you want to do that, call the firehouse uh, during the day, or if you want to come see me after the, this, I'll give you my card. Um, more range of time, we can come out and look at your property with you and tell you if we think there's anything that you can do in terms of mitigation. Do you have like by Kittredge or do I have to call Evergreen? Uh, I would call Evergreen Fire if you're in okay. Kittredge. That's their district. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, well, thanks for hanging in with us so far. We're just a little bit long here, so. Yeah. Uh, not you, just <laughs> us, us in general, not to you. Um, <clears throat> When I first moved up here and talked about, you know, wildfire mitigation in my house, it's like, well, I moved up here so I could live in the trees and, you know, in the hills. And, uh, and of course, I moved into an old house as well, right? And I listened to Mike talk, and it sounds like you want me to tear a house down and, fake, you know, re rebuild it with fire retardant stuff. And, of course, that's not what the intent is. But as you replace your roof or as you do maintenance on your, on your home, uh, Think about fire retardant and, and doing it better because if you have a house that was built 25 years ago, it, you know, nobody's talking about that. So, uh, Mike's got a lot of material back there on firewise, oh, yeah, firewise and mitigation steps you can take. It just happens because we're dumb or lucky, I don't know which, that Jeffco runs a slash collection slash is when you cut off all the low hanging, the low uh, limbs and stuff like that. That stuff that is laying around, what are you going to do with it? They got a collection site that they run at different places around the county. It happens that Indian Hills 
is on the 10th and 11th, so there's a sheet there that gives you the information on that if you get some of that worked out or have some of the, those materials and stuff laying around that you want to get rid of, okay? All right, last item, and we'll get you out of here. Uh, there's a handout on fire code changes that the district board uh, is looking at considering. I'm not going to go through these. It's for your information. Take a look. If you have some feedback on it, please feel free to reach out to Chief Carson or myself uh, with your feedback. But I want to explain what they are. The first talks about uh, the International Wildland Urban Interface Code, which we've adopted as a district, okay? Um, and we omitted Chapter 5 because Chapter 5 talks about uh, building materials and all the fire retardant materials that should be used when you build in a in the movie and in the kind of area we live in. Uh, we don't have the authority to dictate what kind of materials are used for building. Jefferson County Building uh, and Zoning Division does all that stuff, okay? And they're actually in the process, it sounds like, of putting out an addendum to that that talks about what should be used if you're going to do new construction in, in the WUI. Uh, so you can look for that. We just omitted it to eliminate the uh, conflict between what they do and, and that fire code. Uh, and then there's three other recommendations on the International Fire Code. Uh, one talks about if we ask you to put in a cistern, what the size of that should be. Uh, you know, if you live inside the water district, you might have a fire hydrant. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, options that the fire marshal can work with you on your construction in terms of what should be uh, put in place. If you live at the end of a very long road that we're going to have a hard time getting our tender into, okay, we may ask that you install a cistern so there's water supply there. Okay, if you're going to build a new construction, uh, you're probably going to be asked to put in a sprinkler system. Okay. And the sprinkler system is not going to stop a lot of the fire. It's going to save the people who live in the houses' lives because it's going to run for 20 minutes. Okay. And in about 15 to 10 minutes, we're going to get there and hopefully it will have mitigated the fire and got and give you time to get out. So that's the third option. And then the, 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 the second uh, recommendation. And the third one is uh, just flaring further around the fire hydrants so the firefighters have a better area to work. So, so uh, take a look at that. If you have feedback on those uh, modifications that the district board is considering, uh, please let us know. Uh, and we're trying to get the word out on that. And we'll keep you informed in terms of what the Jefferson County Commission is doing in terms of uh, building the appendix for new construction or construction within the within the wooling. It looks like that'll be appendix to the building codes that that did get published. So, anybody have any questions for um, anything we've covered? We've covered a lot. I recognize that. And again, appreciate you uh, hanging in there. Uh, we even had a little fire call. I guess an accident, road rate accident out there in 285 that the firefighters had to go to. But uh, we appreciate you hanging in there and taking time out tonight to attend. And hopefully, we give you some good information you can then utilize. To prepare you and your families uh, in case there is this kind of emergency in our in our district. So. Yeah, go ahead. So I think uh, I'm sure Mike probably talked about this. We were up on the Cold Springs fire a couple of years ago. We done several fires. <clears throat> Mitigation is key. It really does. You see houses that stand alone that've been well mitigated. They survive fires. Houses that don't mitigate, they're gone. Cold Springs came through there. There was four houses in one area, I stand alone survived, and the other ones were just chimneys. That's all that's left in a matter of minutes. So, so mitigate your property, especially during these years, right now when it's wet. I know everybody loves to see trees on their property, but at least make defensible space around your property. That helps us try to save your house too. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.